Well, let's uh, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, if one of you would volunteer to pray, we'll just get started. I can do that. Go ahead. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And we simply ask that as we meet and speak together, that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we're not a large group, but that doesn't matter today. Uh, I want to talk about uh, something that I think is a threat to our religious liberty that I haven't heard anybody speaking of. And I'm not going to really give a full-blown study, but uh, let me just raise a couple of items here. Now, we all know Revelation 13, that we come to a time when no one can buy or sell unless they have the proper ID, uh, the proper, the proper uh, submission. And we also go to Revelation 18, and we see that the destruction of the world system, the final destruction of Babylon and the rest of the world system. So we appear to come be uh, looking biblically that we're coming to a time when uh, there will be a global system that you basically, everybody has to be plugged into. And it's the threat of exclusion from that global system that I think is one of the great levers, one of the great problems we have. So let me put a put our focus just for a moment on the idea, particularly of digital dollars, uh, the, the central bank digital currencies or digital dollars of some kind. So I believe this is a significant issue, the threat of total exclusion from the global financial system. I think that some of our leaders are perhaps very nervous about that. And... We don't want to be potentially excluded from that, but that threat is a lever that is a um, that creates uh, a a set of, of challenges for us if we're going to continue to really do God's work. So let me just kind of put the dominoes up for you here. Uh, so the threat is total exclusion from the global financial system, and I'm looking at this from the standpoint of like church administration, what you would be looking at. So you run a conference, you run a union, um, so on. So there's that threat. Uh, this threat leads ind indirectly to self-censorship to mitigate the risk of exclusion from the system. So if people say the wrong things, they could be knocked out of the global financial system. So we don't want anybody saying anything that's too far off the beam, too far away from the big narrative, whatever the big narrative is this week. And so we can't have people in the church uh, saying anything too substantial because that will certainly become a problem. So that leads kind of indirectly to this uh, censorship issue. Now we're going to put more control on our speakers. We're going to control the pastors more, what the pastors can say. We're going to control more of what any guest speakers can say because we don't want to be excluded from the global financial system. And so now we're kind of doing self-censorship we have the same issue with publishing. What if the great controversy uh, or some other book or books with, with, with that we publish are put on a list of, you know, hate, hate books? Uh, these books are giving hate language or whatever the, the terminology will be in the future. And so now what? Well, we are not going to publish that or we're going to put a different uh, spin on that or we'll leave out a couple of chapters. Uh, and so now we are self-censoring in terms of publishing. So we're self-censoring in terms of what's allowed to be spoken. We're self-censoring in terms of, of publishing. And of course, then we have social media and we can't have people saying anything too weird on social media. And so that becomes a problem. And so these are some of the kinds of risks that you have once you have an authoritarian system that is capable, once you've got the mechanism in place to exclude people from the global financial system, and we've already seen it also happening uh, in terms of secular politics. We've seen people who said the wrong thing or thought the wrong thing. And so uh, their bank suddenly doesn't want to do banking with them anymore. And this is this threat. It, this is the same threat I'm speaking of. It is a threat of exclusion from the global financial system. And so there's kind of a cascading effect here that goes on. Uh, so what this does then is it leads to full monitoring of what's published and now your union papers and everything is kind of now we're going to be extra careful because we don't want to say the wrong thing we don't want to make the wrong bank or the wrong uh government governmentalities or government people unhappy we don't, don't want to make the wrong corporation 
unhappy. And so now you have also a missionary activity and travel. And remember, here's the thing with digital dollars. With digital dollars, the government has its eyeball on every single thing that the church does. Everything, no exceptions, programmable money, and they can put you on a whitelist, a blacklist. They can take you out. Uh, you can be excluded. And so there you have really the, the, the digital dollars is kind of like really practically the end game. Uh, once the bank, once the church is stuck with digital dollars, every single thing we do is going to wind up being closely watched first by ourselves and then by uh, and then by those that are monitoring us. You know, maybe we won't say the right things. Maybe we'll make somebody unhappy in a different part of the world. Uh, and so we have this kind of an issue uh, that goes before us. Um, by the way, if you remember thinking about Revelation 18, how is the church going to faithfully identify those three satanic agents at the end of time that combine together? And there's different threes we can think of, but I'm thinking of the, the Revelation 18 three, Babylon, uh, the kings of the earth, you know, the leaders of the governments and the governmentalities, you know, the corporations, the merchants of the earth. That combination in, is in Revelation, Revelation 18 is condemned as uh, that's the part of the call is to come out of that uh, that control system, and how are we going to give that message when that very control system has us has us you know uh, has us either you know if if you don't play our game you're out of the global financial system, and so these are some of the problems we face because every everything that the 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 church does is now going to be watched with a, you know, and it doesn't even have to be, you've got people back there. It could be an AI thing checking algorithms and they find out, oh no, these people are doing this and off goes the instant message notification and, you know, somebody in authority gets the word. So I think there's a threat of exclusion from the global financial system that is really a, uh, a giant issue. And I'm gonna come to a couple of, a couple of possible helps on this, but let me say one more thing. During the COVID time, uh, we know that uh, our churches, uh, some of us had talks with our different leaders here and there in the church. And uh, one, one uh, church administrator told me something quite, quite fascinating. And what this person said to me was that he said, Larry, the, um, the state health department could walk in at any time and close all of our schools down. They could close our denominational school system down because we're not towing the line with, you know, whatever they whatever their current uh, health requirement is. That means that there's kind of a strong lever there. It's, it's quite similar to this uh, digital dollars kind of lever thing. Uh, you have somebody who really has got you uh, sort of got a lever on you and they can. So so. How many conferences, by the way, if your conference school system closed tomorrow and it closed forever tomorrow, you've got all the schools, the buildings, all the assets, the teacher contracts, et cetera. How many of our conferences, if their school system were closed down tomorrow, would survive that? How many would uh, financially be able to say, OK, we're going to tighten the belt and we're going to make it? I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but. Uh, we need to be careful here. If you're tied in with a hospital, if you're tied in with the school system and the government can at a whim just shut you down, you know, you guys aren't wearing enough masks and, and stuff like that. You're not vaccinated enough, et cetera. Um, that is a pretty serious exposure. That's called, you know, the threat surface, all the different places where you can be attacked. And when you are locking down a, a computer device or something, you try to, you try to um, make sure you have a minimum threat surface. Um, I was thinking about the house that I grew up in and, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this and there are there, it turns out there are nine windows because we did an add on when I was 10 or 11 years old. So anyway, there's nine windows and five doors. And as I thought about the doors, if I were a thief trying to break into that house, there are especially two doors that are have very very limited visibility around them. I mean, you could you could stand there and saw a hole in the door and who would see you? So if I were going to break into that house that I grew up in, I would look for the, 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 I would figure out what's the threat surface. I wouldn't probably go in through the front door. I would go in through one of the side doors somewhere that uh, that none of the neighbors can even see. 
Why go in through a window where, you know, nobody's going to see that. So the church has, uh, as soon as we have large institutions, we have kind of a, a expanded threat surface. And then, there, then people have levers against that. I mean, we're living in a time now where, and uh, we did a video on this here not long ago uh, about the Australia, the, in Canberra, Australia, there was a hospital system. There were Roman Catholic hospital that wouldn't do abortions, wouldn't do euthanasia and so on. The government got really tired of them. And so the government just walked in and said, okay, you're closed. We're going to do a forced acquisition. We're going to give you some, 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 uh, some chits here. Here's some money for you. Uh, go away. We, we now own your stuff. And that's what they did. I mean, this is we're in a spot where basically looting is now beginning to happen, uh, where if you have a large enough, substantial enough institution, the government, government might just walk in and say, thank you very much. This is ours now. Goodbye. Uh, so having large institutions that can be shut down at a whim or taken over at a whim, uh, it creates a, uh, a threat surface, a substantial exposure and gives people levers to um, to push and squeeze and make the church do what they want the church to do. So anyway, I mentioned that uh, as we're just thinking about this, I had a couple of thoughts about what steps we might take to to deal with this uh, threat. Uh, because you say, well, I'm worried about the digital dollars is a religious liberty issue. And you say, well, fine. Well, what can we do about it? Well, I think there are a couple of things to think about. Basically, the, the plan here is to reduce the frick, the the friction surface. We want to reduce the threat surface, the places where we can be uh, nailed. You know, like if you're uh, if you're doing something where people can gouge your eyes out, you might want to wear goggles. There was an NBA player or one or more NBA players at one time who kept getting poked in the eyes, so they started wearing goggles. They reduced the threat surface. So what about us? Well, one thing we can do is, and what we should be doing, I think, as a church, as a denomination, we should begin looking at ways that we can divide what we do so that there are things things that aren't that are outside the world global financial system what can we do as a church where how many things do we have to be attached to the global financial system to do i think if we start thinking carefully we may find there's a number of things we can do without any exposure of risk at all to the global financial system i mean the early church in the time of rome they weren't exactly, I don't think, plugged into everything, and yet they turned the world upside down. So I think I think that's something to look at. Our conferences should be looking at how we can operate. Uh, and there's going to be two sets of things. There's going to be a set, set of things like basically when you look at the government directive, and I've, I've read most of them, if not all of them, uh, put out by the current presidential administration. Uh, what this is going to come to uh, is any payments you get from the government are going to come in CBDCs. So tax returns, um, uh, any interface with the government on taxes, all that stuff is probably going to basically get everybody stuck in the in the thing with CBDCs. It's, it is probably perhaps close to inescapable that you'll have some interaction with the government on this because if they start, if they do start doing business entirely, ultimately in CBDCs. But does everything have to be that way? Do we have to... Um, you know, that's just another question is how can we do things where we're basically outside the system? Once we're uh, outside the things we take outside the system, there is no lever there from within the system. And so the wise course of action is to find out where you're vulnerable and fix the vulnerabilities before the thief gets there. So um, so that's a thing I think the church should be doing. What else, let's see. What other notes do I have? Explore what we can do outside the approved financial system. Uh, operate the church with two groups of activities, which is just what I just said, those that interface with the approved financial system and those that operate independently of the approved financial system. So if we think about that, we'll find ways that perhaps we can do things um, that uh, that are outside of that. So anyway, just these are just quick thoughts. This is not a comprehensive thought, uh, you know, by any means, but I do believe that digital dollars creates a, uh, a very, very serious area of threat to the liberty of the church and will lead to self-censorship, control of speakers, uh, many of such these such kinds of problems. And I haven't heard anybody speak of it. I mean, I've heard a lot, a lot of us have warned about, uh, be careful, the digital dollar is going to be a problem. But what actual steps, what actual things are we doing to look at that and say, um, boy, if even six months from now, if there was a global financial collapse and 
we were stuck in a spot where, you know, suddenly, boom, we got 60 days. We've got to do business with digital dollars. Um, are we ready for that? Are we giving any thought to it whatsoever? Uh, are there not some ways that the church can operate? Some things the church can do that are entirely out, would be able to be done entirely aside from the structure of the global financial system. And I think that's a lever that, that, uh, that, the, that people have against the church to force the church into their way. As long as the church is desperate to fit into the global financial structure, uh, that means that um, there is a dramatic lever there against us. So just some quick thoughts on, um, on that. And so I want to welcome everybody. I think there's a few more that have joined us. Uh, today, we're kind of on a hard, uh, hard break. We're going to go, we can only go until about a half hour or maybe a little longer from now. I've got to stop before six. So I've got other things coming up. So uh, we'll keep it shorter today. But uh, anyway, welcome each one. And just some, uh, I just wanted to start with that. And uh, let's get any reactions to that. And then we'll maybe get an update from last week. And uh, or maybe you can, maybe you have some ideas on this topic too. Uh, and, and by the way, am I all wet? Is this uh, is digital dollars not even remotely a, a religious liberty issue? Do we is it okay if the government just sees every dollar the church is spending and what it's spending it on? Is that is that like not a problem? So anyway, I'll throw it back here, and uh, I don't think I've muted you all. Hopefully, you're self muted, and if you want to speak. You um, speak up, and we'll try to try to take it without running over everybody, just one at a time. All right. What do you think, Pastor Larry? Yeah. Isn't there a website called like Alternate? It's Alternate Economy or Alternate. Uh, I can't think of the other word for it. Um, but I know there's a couple places that talk about it where they're trying to set up an alternate like economy separate oh, I'm from sure there are I'm sure there are several places like that uh when I've looked into that before and I may be just behind but when I've looked into that before they have stuff like like um stuff like uh barter they want to emphasize barter with each other uh there are some uh cities and things where they're doing their own form of money so to speak um, I, so so anyway, well, those are some of the things. Maybe there's newer newer approaches as well. I have somebody speaking and I'm not hearing you. If you could speak up a little bit, let's try again. And by the way, just say, yeah, let me know who's talking. Who? Just quickly there, I wanted to, to jump in just to say a couple of things, what you're saying. I, I think what you're saying that is uh, is accurate, that this is definitely a problem. It's going to be a vector of control. Of course, the 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 uh, Revelation 13 makes it very clear buying and selling is going to be a problem, and the the three agents uh, revealed in Revelation 18, big religion, big government, and big business are going to converge to create a system where no one will be able to escape. So I know right now there are parallel economies. People are talking about parallel economies, and uh, but that that will all collapse. It'll all be enfolded eventually into one system that no one will be able to buy and sell outside of that system. So, you know, but this is going to happen in degrees. So it's going to happen in steps and it happens in steps and degrees in different places. In uh, some of the things that I've been listening to with regards to CBDCs, for example, uh, North America, Canada, US, uh, the Western nations are going heavy into it, but there are other places in the world that are not so much. And even when they do, they don't have the infrastructure and they don't have the will to uh, to control like some other areas, and this is what I've been listening to. The different the, there's gentlemen talking about how to escape the CBDCs and live in different countries that are going to be easier on people, and and there are other markets, other nations, other places that are opening up. So, you know, we're all going to be impacted in a different way. So the church is going to have to adapt to a local situation. We're going to have a, a local like a province situation or a state situation in the United States. And then you're going to have a national situation. You're going to have a city situation. So uh, it's, I don't think it'll be a one size fits all solution that we're looking for, but we're going to have to ask, basically ask God to help us in our local situation. What are we going to do? And I think 
one of the things that we can do with regards to immediately what you said with um, with the uh, homeschooling or with schooling is to look and to prepare for home churches and homeschooling. Because I think you, you don't have to necessarily do it now, but prepare to do it. Because then what you have, it's more difficult for the government to squash, you know, 20 homes than it is to squash one building. So one building, it comes in, it's squashed. But 20 different homes, 30 different families, that's harder to do. So that's one thing that I think is certainly uh, something to to uh, consider. Okay. Who's next? Hi, this is Andrew. Yeah, um, go ahead, Andrew. I put a diagram in the group chat that shows different ways that a system can be organized. You can have a centralized system, you can have a decentralized system, or you can have a distributed system. And in times of crisis, where you don't want to have a lot of dependencies between different aspects of a system, like a church system, for example, you'd want every single node of that system to, to be able to stand alone or stand with a small cohort of other um, nodes in the system. So if you look at the diagram I put in the chat, it would rep be represented by item C, where every node, if cut off, won't destroy the system, but is all part of the system. And if cut off, can also stand alone, um, instead of being dependent on a, a central node. Um, and I think that's important. I think what Pastor Larry said at the beginning, that we need to be coordinating and, and kind of getting to know the churches in our area, know what their strengths and weaknesses are, what their needs are, because those are our closest um, elements in the node, like geographically speaking. So if transportation became difficult to go from one place to the other, say artificial borders were set up because travel is restricted due to climate reasons, we'd, we'd know who our closest people are, what their needs are, what, their, what they have. Um, uh, to help each other. Uh, so I just wanted to turn everyone's attention to that that diagram and, and thinking about how we can become more like a distributed network as opposed to a centralized network where there's single points of failure that could cause everything to collapse. Yeah, I, that's my I comment. think that uh, I appreciate that very much. And I think that that's really a key, a key piece. Um, as a as a bunch of separate maybe this word separate is not the one I want, but anyway, if we're kind of a mesh of nodes, it's a lot harder to squish something. If you've got every node, it's like America, you know, you have the second amendment. Um, we're going to come in and, and uh, take over America with guns. Well, you can try that, but there's a lot of guns out there in America. And uh, the second amendment's kind of a protection, a hedge against that. Uh, the same way, if we are, um, network together but each piece is its own piece it's pretty hard to squish something or um, force it down from the top so this decentralized element that you are uh, putting forth uh, is is a pretty uh, might be a very timely piece for the church uh, and, and i don't think anybody here is advocating you know leaving the, the seventh day Adventist church structure but uh, as we look and we see the things that are coming down the pike, and I mean, some of them are absolutely barreling down at us. Um, these are not just theoretical pieces of the future anymore. Uh, look what happened to the uh, trucker convoy in Canada. Um, that was the same. That was the very thing of what I just talked about. Um, they cut off the truckers from their financial system. Done. And uh, I think we're going to see more and more of this. And the CBDCs, the digital digital dollars, just uh, gives a much, much, much stronger means of controlling and cutting people off from the financial system. And if the church doesn't uh, think carefully about this and recognize this as a potential threat to its witness, uh, you know, there will be a, 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 some kind of a crisis and then we'll be down to, you know, in, in the next 60 days, we're all switching over to digital dollars. Don't worry, the Calvary's coming. Ca um, 
And next thing you know, before we even think about it, we'll all be doing digital dollars. The government will have its finger on every single thing the church does. And there is a totalitarian nightmare right uh, imminent once you get to that spot. Last week, I don't know how many of you were on last, not last week, but the previous occasion, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about the, uh, one of the key ideas was, uh, we're talking about conferences and the guest speaker guidelines and things, and we didn't publish that video because we were keeping some things private, but um, at, at your request. But as we, uh, one thing we suggested was, that local you should go out and get to know people near your local church and uh, find out what's going on in your conference area i don't know if any of you are here if any of you did any of that or were able to plan to do that uh, find out if in some of the places at least that were represented last time uh, we had guest speakers being blocked uh, by by their their conference and trying to figure out if this is just a couple of uh, not independent, not related things happening, or if this is uh, increasing in our midst and trying to figure out if uh, make connections with people in other churches and in our other sisterhood of churches, churches, and um, find out what is going on in other places. Is there anybody here who, who, um, who took that? line and was able to check in with your sister churches or some people there and kind of find out what's going on in other places. Well, like I, like I said last week, for those who may have, or not last week, I did the same thing you did <laughs> uh, uh, the last time. Uh, so my personal experience is that this happened to me. So uh, throughout the whole conference. I'm not under censure. I'm not under um, discipline of any type. Never been approached in that way. Just told I can't speak. So so it's happened personally to me. It may be that some of the folks that were on the previous occasion aren't with us uh, in this meeting. Uh, I don't think notice of this meeting got put out quite as widely. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to um, speak to what we've spoken of so far? Or um, there's two kind of directions I want to go here in the latter part of our talk. Uh, maybe I'll just throw those out there and we can have a discussion here if, if there's an interest in it. Um, there's two things that I think we should be doing that again doesn't tie it's not anything about abandoning our current church structure or anything like that but there's a couple of things that that would be helpful to us and uh one of those things is is sort of what we just talked about getting networked getting connected with your fellow church members and your sister churches all around you know as a pastor i know that uh if i go east i've got this church if i go north i've got this church you know my next over from my district um, and so on south, I've got this church. I kind of know the churches around me. Um, and as a church member, you could sort of know where those churches are and go and visit them and get to know some of the people there. Maybe you already do. And that gives you kind of connections to people and it might help you know different things that are happening or not happening in the conference. Uh, I know of one conference that just had a constituency meeting very recently and um, well, I believe one of the key conference officers, I was told that um, he was reelected with only 25 or with 25 or 30 percent no, uh, did not vote for him. So he only came in with a 70 or a low 70s percent approval. I'm not talking about my conference. Um, I can't remember what our numbers were last week, but I'm thinking of another conference um, that when, when you could score that low. I mean, that's an indication there's there's definitely some. Uh, some interesting business uh, going on where you're not getting this big support. So um, anyway, getting to know other churches, you may find out why somebody is not getting a lot of support because maybe they came in and tried to strong arm that church on some issue. So 
uh, anyway, that the, the, so the one thing is getting connected with your fellow church members in other congregations outside your own. And the other thing is to find a point of action that you can engage in um, that is a, will advance present truth and have a group of people that actually do it. Uh, I'm not saying you don't work with your church that's already doing, you know, all the different things it's chosen to do. But I'm, I'm talking about maybe smaller groupings of people uh, who get together and they all say, look, you know, uh, we want to go out to the uh, such and such a place and we're going to distribute tracts or we're going to go out and knock on doors and get some Bible studies. or We're going to uh, go to this um, county fair and we're going to distribute and give out the, the great controversy. I'm talking about projects like that, that people can combine with that they don't need. It doesn't need to go through the church. Um, they could go through the church, but uh, I'm talking about things that people would do connected with each other and connected and being done uh, without necessarily the benefit or oversight of the church, not in competition with the church in any way, but just things that we can do to take the initiative and get some things done. Something, action, some action we can combine uh, our energies on and do it to advance present truth. So those are the two things, um, getting connected with members in other churches and finding some point of commonality and a point of action you can take together to advance present truth. Um, that that little twofold, two-pronged thing would be something that could happen all over the place in different in different places and different conferences. And the, the more we know our brother and sister believers, why yeah, no harm is going to come to us for knowing better our brother and sister believers, will it? So that is a way we can make sure that we've if you're in a church and people are all sleeping and and, um, you know, they're getting nice, nice messages each Sabbath, but everything they do is confined within the, the walls of that church. The devil wouldn't mind that at all, would he? So I'm talking about getting present truth out, out into the highways and byways and being a part of that and have, having, uh, getting, developing local, local connections so that that happens. I was thinking about what you said, Pastor. Um and uh, one of the ways that we can reach out to our sister churches in our our area would be to bring them something that we can offer to complement their existing ministry, um, so maybe something specifically related to present truth or to share a, a ministry um, tactic that may have worked for our church um, so that um, we can start building that nodal network that is um, replicating itself over different nodes, that that area of expertise with regard to outreach um, or with regard to um, maybe even just building up a library of, of information, um, hard copy or digital copy of information that would be helpful, um, say, if we were to lose access to a central repository of of information if we were able to um go to our sister churches with that in hand i think we'd be more welcome because we're bringing something to the table as we build relationships with our our sister churches we're saying hey here's something that worked for us when we witnessed at the county fair for example um these are the books that really um that moved really quickly um, these are the tracks that didn't move so quickly, and we think that this approach worked. And and I think that cross pollination um, would be one way to start that conversation um, and build each other up mutually, and at at the same time start building those nodes of resilience, so that if our you know our centralized systems of communication with each other, say if we're unable to govern ourselves centrally through a conference anymore because the conference was shut down. Well, at least we've already built up these relationships. We know who to call for the next church over. Um, and we know what they have because we helped to build it. That's just a, my my thought. Thank you. Yeah, no, I I think that's exactly in the line of what I'm I'm looking at. Uh, the the we're not we're not looking at a future that's 15 or 20 years away when we might start to get these problems. Um I I I'd like to think that, but I, I think that the threat is immeasurably closer 
than that. And yet, uh, uh, maybe maybe there's things happening that I just haven't heard of, but I really haven't heard of any substantive preparations being made. And certainly, the COVID time would uh, help us to recognize that um, we were taught we were caught utterly flat-footed at that time. Uh, there was we were not ready. I wasn't ready. My churches weren't ready. I don't believe my conference was ready. My union or division were not ready, and my general conference was not ready. Um, and that's on us. We were wrong. We should have been more ready. But uh, three years have gone by, more than three years. We we should begin to draw lessons. Um, we may not have three years. We may not have 18 months before the next crisis, uh, substantial civilization rattling crisis comes upon us. Um, and yet, I don't see us taking any steps at all to be resilient. Might I suggest one one thing too, on a very uh, immediate and practical level, you know, uh, that on the level of the family, the individual family, uh, something that can be done is to to have things set aside that should your access to digital uh, banking systems or whatever become compromised, even through not, no fault of yourself or no, nothing that you've said, but through an EMP attack, as they have been hinting at, you know, through some type of uh, bank hacking that they've also been hinting at. So it's not because that you have done something wrong. It's because the bank has been hacked or something like that. So I think it's a good idea to lay aside in your domicile, in your home, things like, you know, some extra cash and perhaps uh, extra food and perhaps uh, some supplies for yourself. And not only for yourself, but uh, also to prepare to help your neighbor, because that's going to be a method of outreach. And people are going to ask, how did you know? Because most people don't know. Most people are not clued in as to what's happening. And uh, and you know, some people are. You can see that on the internet and different, different people are speaking. But a lot of people are not clued in to what this was about and uh, what is coming in the future. So as we are personally prepared, not just prepared for ourselves, but prepared to help others, that will be a vector of evangelism uh, that is going to be useful for us. So, you know, put extra aside right now as you can because uh, availability of food is good it's not just going to be ex super expensive it's going to be possibly not available you know uh, i have a a friend that passed away several years ago anyways she uh, grew up and her, she, she and her husband grew up in communist yugoslavia and uh, I, she told me that the first time she came into a supermarket in uh, in canada she nearly fainted especially when she saw the meat aisle because that is the you never saw that much meat and food in one spot. Uh, so we are heading to something probably similar where you have to stand in line for your your one cup of uh, flour, your your two tea tablespoons of sugar and and whatnot. you know So put things aside for yourselves and for perhaps for others uh, uh, sharing amongst church family. Mm -hmm. you know, so these are things that are practical that we can do now to prepare and also to help our neighbors uh, when the time comes, because giving them a loaf of bread when bread is uh, is scarce. That's the gospel. By the way, a quick uh, thought. How would you respond to somebody because somebody's going to raise it up, perhaps? How do you respond to somebody who says, oh, we shouldn't prepare for the time of trouble? Um maybe you've already kind of made your response, but yeah. I, there's a sense in which I think that could be uh, that I, I, I agree a little bit with that warning. I mean, I don't believe these things are going to save us, but I think that um, the Bible also tells us that, you know, the, uh, the smart person sees danger coming and he, he hides himself, you know, that comes up two or three times in the Proverbs. Yeah. So it's a very, it's actually, I think a biblical plan to be uh, alert, to have your eyeballs open and to, uh, take measures to to be wise, not to trust your salvation to those measures, but it's still, you know, on a day when you're pretty hungry, it might be useful if you know where you've got some extra potatoes stored. The yeah, it's it's very simple. I know that uh, people get 
uh, they read the the portion of Sister White where she talks about, you know, there'll come a time when, uh, you know, don't have uh, food in your field because armed men will come and take it or food stored because it'll spoil. But that's nearly right to the end. That's nearly to the close of probation. We're not there yet. We're not even to the Sunday law enforcement yet. There is a process by these things happen. So we are not at that point yet. And so as far as I'm concerned, once we get there, we get there. But we're not there. So there are things that we can do, not only for ourselves, but as a tool of evangelism uh, that is necessary for us because we know and the the text you're you're referencing is in proverbs i forget which what the the text is but it says you know prudent man sees the evil foresees the evil and he hides himself but the the simple goes on and is punished we don't have to be simple you know i'm not talking about hoarding you don't have to hoard but pray to god to your comfort level and your ability to set aside by all means set aside and prepare to help others, to help yourself, to help your, your brethren, your church, your Seventh-day Adventist brethren, and to help others. And thereby, we can then actually help other people who are feeling caught in this system that is going to come upon them unawares. They're going to feel like they're forced. They're going to feel like they're being hedged in. And we can say, no, here's something that will that will help you in the meantime, so you don't have to entangle yourself as much in the system. And I think that's a path of wisdom. So I know that's what I'm personally doing, and I'm not pushing that on anyone. But I would say I would say that's a wise thing to do. So I'll put it that way. Can I add something? Go ahead. So it's important not to fear the things that we don't know. We we can't know some of the things that will happen in the future. The uncertainties. Um, could lead to any kind of scenario. But what we do know is what we can see with our eyes, which God has blessed us with, and the and the ability to think about the risks that we see. And I think, um, as it is said in Proverbs, we, we should prepare for those things that we can foresee and for those that we cannot, that are just well beyond our comprehension in terms of what could come down the pipe for us. We, we cast ourselves into the hands of Almighty God, you know, we can't prepare for every eventuality. We just prepare our hearts to accept that we are we are whatever prepare preparation we do physically, mentally, that we are in God's hands. There's not much we can do other than that when when those times come. You know, we prepare for the best uh, with the best of intentions, and, and then we accept that God will bless our efforts and our ability to bless our families and our neighbors. When that time comes, and I would just add to Marco's comment about preparing, you know, beyond the first order needs like food and water, I think it's important for us to have physical copies of books that um, uh, are important um, to our faith, the Bible, number one. Um, and and I know, you know, there's always the threat of an EMP or your, uh, you know, your digital things being taken away. But I think it's important to have a copy digitally as well as physically. And why I think digitally is important as well to have copies of digital things is because it's easy to transmit digital stuff, at least right now. And uh, I know in the Eastern Bloc, uh, there was a system of samizdat where you would... Um, share censored and uh, self-published uh, documents that would be dissenting against what uh, what was happening around them in, in the communist bloc. Uh, people would share those documents and to be self-published. And I think that'd be important for us to have digital copies to be able to circulate amongst us. It'd be carried in a flash drive or sent, uh, sent clandestinely. So it's important to have both physical as well as digital copies of things just so that we can be able to share things amongst ourselves and with others uh, when the time comes, when it's important to do that. So I, I thought I'd add that. Yeah, no, I like that you've added that because uh, I think there was a period of time where I thought, man, everything that's serious, I want to get it. I want to, I want hard copy. But um, today it's becoming very uh, much easier to trans uh, transmit something and send it off to your friend digitally. Uh, that we've really come to a spot where with all the pluses and minuses, um, that's one of the pluses is that we could share um, prescribed books and materials uh, 
depending on how how severe the crackdown is on it, but we may be able to share a lot of that very rapidly via digital means. Um, so yeah, definitely we should have digital copy of the Great Controversy, et cetera, on the different books and things that are important. Uh, we need hard copy, but I think to have digital copies of things that we can share with people. And, you know, if you have 100 people in the park, um, if we have 100 people in the park, why you can share 100 copies of Great Controversy and, and by pressing the button one time in, in a certain circumstance. I saw that in Canada, and I know there's at least one or two Canadians here with us, but I saw that in Canada, there, the the CRTC, what is it? The Canadian Radio and Tele, Telecast. They are now looking to regulate. They've passed an online streaming law, and they're going to regulate so that you have to register if you give a podcast. And I think I read it. It was a, if you generate revenue of a million, uh, $10 million or more. Or maybe I'm mistaken. But just the idea that the government would um, is this true? Is this current that actually Canada is telling its citizens you must register your podcast with us? Or is that just like the, the big rich ones? Well, I, I think it, I come from, I mean, living in Canada. So it's, yeah, I think it has a limit or a, a, a hard uh, $10 million cap. That's when you start. But to start at all, is uh all, yeah. is is completely against what we what we believe in and what we have for freedoms in Canada. In fact, the Liberal government years ago, Trudeau government gave six hundred and sixty million dollars, distributed that money to various uh, news agencies throughout Canada. So they've already started doing hush money. That was years ago, and of course those are are now agents of the state. As soon as you accept, as soon as you accept money from the state, you become an agent of the state. If you are now, you're now a state media. I, I forget what they call that in, but they called that in Russia. They had a, a specific, a specific name for yes. that. Yes. Yeah. We're facing, uh, we're facing increasing censorship here in Canada. As I said, a lot of these threats, you know, that we thought were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years away, maybe. And, and just to jump in, also Facebook has blocked news. You can't you can't put a news article link in Facebook in Canada. It'll block it. You have to you have to kind of fiddle around it. So if it's anything from news, Facebook won't allow it in Canada. So that we are becoming, um, you know, a very communist country or fascist. Actually, you know, either either way, it's going either way. Uh, both are incredibly evil systems. But this is what's happening in Canada. I heard it described recently in a way that was uh, remarkable. Uh, what we're basically getting across the West now is fascism with communism inside. Fascism with communism inside. You have this combination of, of the, the, the corporations with the governments. That's fascism. And then now, you know, inside of that, what we're getting is the, you know, the identity politics. And, um, oh, you're a doctor that said something we don't like. Guess what? Your license is is over. You're done. You will not be allowed to be on the media, and now you won't be allowed to practice medicine. By the way, don't forget to pay your finish paying your your, uh, your medical loans. And another thing that's happening in British Columbia specifically is that farmers here are having their water restricted, even at the hottest part of the summer. Uh, and, and the water tables were fine. The farmers have they they keep an eye on the water table. Uh, yet in British Columbia. They were actually restricting farmers right when the harvest had needed it to water their crops. So creating system and the farmers actually refuse. So now there's a fight. They're going to be fined whether or not the, the, the farm's going to stand. So we are we are having some really serious issues going on here in Canada. And it's getting uh, it's getting very, very bad. OK, before we finish, uh, we've got just a couple more minutes. We're going to need to tie it off. Uh, anybody want to speak to anything that we have spoken to so far or add something else? Uh, maybe some of you that are listening, but you haven't uh, haven't spoken. Um, so we've talked about digital dollars as a threat to religious liberty and how the church can potentially um, discover 
which things it has to be plugged into the global financial system to do and which things it can do uh, without any exposure to the global financial system. Um, we've talked about connecting with our fellow brothers and sisters in the sister churches right nearby us so we get to know each other and form sort of a decentralized um, mesh or network or grid. And we've talked about finding something that we can do with our brothers and sisters um, that doesn't require, uh, you know, if the church was closed tomorrow by the government or something, you can do it anyway. Uh, what can we do by just connecting with each other and uh, making connections with our fellow church members and um, also finding some action, something that we can do that will advance present truth in the area where God has put us in that part and that vineyard, uh, those two things. And so we get a handle on things that are happening in our conferences. And then also we are, um, we're not caught flat footed, if not if, but when the next emergency arises. And we talked about some other things. So anybody else want to throw in here before we uh, we finish for today? One of the things I, that I, I think, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. One of the things that I was uh, thinking about lately is that I belong to a very small church and we've only got three families in our church. But uh, in our area, I wanted to connect with other like-minded individuals. So I thought if I were to have specific types of classes like not just cooking classes or what but actually like prepping classes survival classes knowledge classes like teaching people what an EMP is how to prepare that kind of stuff and also uh, specific types of health classes and then I got access to a, a, the list of many different emails of people in my conference and I was thinking if I were to send that out that invitation and invite people to my church it actually might be bring some people out of the woodwork because i know occasionally i'll get somebody in my church that'll be like oh i love this church it's like one of the only traditional churches left in this area hmm. and so i thought maybe if i send that email out it might attract other people like i know if i got an email that had a class for a topic that's not like uh you know, a singles retreat in Dubai, which is like something our conference is doing. If it was something interesting, I might go out there and see what it was all about and see who these people are. So that's just something I was throwing uh, throwing around because we have people in our church that can teach those kind of classes. So maybe we'll send that out, blast it to all those emails we got a uh, hold of and see what kind of connections we can make with people out there. And also maybe attract people to our church so it could grow with like more people and we could be more powerful to do the work we need to do okay very good okay i heard another voice also uh, i have got a url a domain a website and a uh, mailing list i've paid for i'm gonna have to explain that to my wife here pretty quick uh which doesn't exist yet uh but i'm looking for some help because right now i'm kind of uh over over committed to too many things uh, but this would be a way we could communicate and coordinate together a little bit. I don't know if there's somebody here. It's just a WordPress site. It's fairly simple, although I seem to be having a little bit of challenge making this thing work the way I wanted. Um, so I'm looking for a little help, though. I don't know if any of you, uh, is that something that would be up your alley? But if so, um, if we could uh, set this up so that people can uh, opt into a mailing list, then we could use that to kind of coordinate uh, because we don't really have a system to coordinate and be in contact with each other. So I'll just raise that as a possibility. If anybody has any potential help for me, email me at uh, the email address, pastorlarry at runbox, R-U-N-B-O-X dot com. And um, I will probably want to work with you uh, so we can get that up and running but more than I have it presently up and running. Um, so anyway, that's something I'd like to get some help on. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe this is this will never come to anything. Maybe we're not going to um, combine, but it might be that it would be well for us to sort of begin that network sort of amongst ourselves. So anyway, I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to stop there. I wonder if one of you uh, that hasn't spoken could share with us a kind of closing prayer. 
Um, I was going to speak a little earlier, but I was having problems with my um, Zoom options, so I couldn't speak. I just, just quickly, I wanted to say, you know, the idea of getting together, networking, and doing the Lord's work, this is a very old idea, which is the gospel commission. And, um, you know, it, this circumstance that we all find ourselves in just reminds me of that quote that says, um, that which the the church failed to do um, in the times of peace, she's going to have to do under the times of greatest distress or something like that. And um, that's exactly. really what it's going to come down to is we just have to do the work that um, we've gotten too big and unwieldy and um, technological for. And uh, it's just very simple. Anyway, I will have closing prayer. Thank Dear you, Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to bless our ideas, Lord. Give us ideas. We don't want to be working out of our own human strength and understanding. And also, please send us forward um, two by two as you requested. You pair us, please, Lord, these hu feeble human efforts. Um, Lord, we, we're doing our best, but we ask you to multiply our strength and our efforts. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. And uh, we're going to drop it there. But uh, maybe we can get together in two more weeks. Um, so thank you for joining us. God bless.